this was the day. This was the day this sign became more than a symbol. It doesn't mean survival anymore. It is survival. The sirens whose shrill cry of warning triggered a whole complex chain of events are now still. They have done their job. Before the siren sounded, this man was already at the emergency operating center. This is Dan Carter. Average citizen? Average citizens do not know about decontamination factors, equivalent residual dose, or rentgens. Dan Carter does. He has taken hours of intensive training and hours more in perfecting his skill. As RADEF officer for his community, he was on the job at his community's emergency operating center long before the public warning was sounded. Like Dan Carter, the staff in this EOC have been well trained to handle their vital jobs. The EOC is the nerve center of the community's emergency operations. Radiological service is an essential staff function in this and every government EOC. This is where information on the radiological hazard is received, evaluated, analyzed, and put into usable form. Such information is essential for the conduct of emergency operations. The assistant RADEF officer is Howard Swanson. His training has been as intensive as Carter's. He is fully prepared to assume Carter's job if necessary. George Scully and Fred Morgan are the RADEF section's plotter analyst, a job which calls for the careful collection and recording of the large volume of RADEF data that will soon come pouring into this EOC. They will record incoming data on maps and logs. They will evaluate radiation decay patterns and estimate exposures of people. Scully and Morgan are not just average citizens either. They know these procedures as a result of hours of on-the-job training. The tools of their trade include maps, overlays, slide rules, nomograms, graph paper, wax pencils, compasses, protractors, and fallout templates. In this community, the functions of the RADEF officer, his assistant, the plotter analyst, are handled by separate people. However, in smaller government EOCs, all of the RADEF activities may have to be combined and handled by one person. In this EOC, the RADEF staff is divided into two shifts. Carter and Scully will handle one shift, Swanson and Morgan the other. One of the initial activities will be forecasting fallout based on the UF wind data and likely target areas. Swanson has just received the latest UF data from the Weather Bureau. There you are, George. Right. Dan, if Cobb Air Force Base is hit, I suppose we get fallout in this area. Well, they just got the UF data. Hasn't been plotted yet. How soon? Ten minutes. All right. Okay, I'll be back. Dan Carter is first concerned with verifying the operational readiness of his fallout monitoring network. Each station will report to the EOC as soon as at least one monitor is on duty and has checked his equipment at the station. Readiness reports from assigned shelter monitors will be included with the first report of each shelter manager. These monitors will enlarge the RADEF collection network. Each point on the collection network is systematically logged in as it reports to the EOC. Hey, how's it going, Dan? Well, Colonel, some of the monitors haven't shown up at their stations as yet. Well, do you want to begin reassigning people to these stations now or hold off a bit to see if they come in? Now, we're going to wait. Most will probably report in. Okay. Yeah, Frank, Dan. Now, we'll hold off a while. Yeah, just if some monitors don't report to their stations, the RADEF officer may reassign monitors from other locations to the undermanned points in the network. One of the first pieces of the RADEF picture 
the fallout forecast, is just being completed. These plots outline areas of serious fallout and show an approximate time of fallout arrival. They are employed as an aid in the early analysis of potential radiological hazards. That's done. Oh, all finished? Yep. Okay, let's get it up there, huh? All right. Where's the forecast? It's really not a forecast now, Phil. George, Cobb Air Force Base has just been hit. Now, we're expecting a hazardous fallout in our area, and it should arrive based on the forecast in about uh, two hours. That's all I can give you now. I'll feed you the changes as fast as they come in, Phil. Okay, Dan, I'll check back with you. All right. Dan Carter will provide the emergency information officer with information to be included in an advisory which will be broadcast over the local area emergency broadcast system station. These advisories will tell the public what will probably happen, how it will affect them, and what steps they should take to protect themselves. These advisories are also of value to industries with extensive shutdown operations and to farmers and ranchers in making arrangements for the protection of their livestock as well as their families. The forecasts, however, are only rough predictions. The actual fallout arrival time can only be determined by trained monitors at fixed field locations and in public shelters who periodically check outside radiation levels. When the radiation level reaches five-tenths of a Rentgen per hour, monitors send flash reports of fallout arrival to the EOC. As EOCs downwind of Cobb Air Force Base verify the arrival of fallout, this information is fed into both state and neighboring EOCs, as well as into Dan Carter's section. This mutual exchange of RADEF information verifies forecasts and other radiological information being plotted by similar staffs in other EOCs. Following the flash report, the RADEF monitor will provide an unsheltered dose rate report to his EOC at least once each three hours for the first 24 hours. Thereafter, the requirements for scheduled reports will be less frequent. In addition, a report of unsheltered accumulated dose will be forwarded once daily to the EOC. In this city's RADEF monitoring network, there are 18 stations. 14 of these are established at fire stations, police stations, and other government or industrial locations. Four are established in community shelters. Two of the 18 monitoring stations serve as collection points to relay information to the EOC. To provide geographical coverage, rural monitoring stations are also used. Information from these stations is fed to county or other designated EOC. The RADEF section receives the monitoring information from the EOC message center. It is immediately recorded on a log. Each vertical column on the log is a written record of the fallout situation within the city at specified hours. It also shows stations from which reports have not been received. Horizontal columns show dose rate histories of the various stations and accumulated radiation exposure doses. After logging the information, it is plotted on a map of the area. Dose rate contours may be drawn to provide better display of the data if the information is sufficiently detailed. Oh, yes, Colonel. This is up to date, isn't it, Dan? Well, Scully's working on the latest analysis now. Based on our last dose rate plots, we've got a shelter problem in this area right here. We've got to take some action now, if your estimates are correct. Well, unless we find a better solution, we may have to move some people into the radiation-free area across the county line. Nay, don't you know now? No, nope. these analyses are just not that accurate. 
Now, Colonel, I, I just can't uh, really make a positive recommendation until I have more specific information on two things. The actual exposures of people in the poor shelters and the dose rates in these areas right here. To illustrate the collection of this information and the normal flow of RADEF data, consider these dose rates at the 18 city monitoring stations. By averaging the dose rates from selected stations, a representative dose rate for the city is found to be about 75 Rentkins per hour. This value is forwarded to the county EOC, where the county RADEF staff combines it with representative dose rates from other communities in the county. And in most instances, a single rate for the county is sent to the state EOC. As new radiological data are received and analyzed, Dan Carter periodically provides information for inclusion in post-attack advisories. As before, the emergency information officer uses Carter's information in EBS broadcasts to the public, telling them of the changes in the radiological picture within the city. The EOC message center relays RADEF staff guidance to shelter managers throughout the city on when they can begin to allow persons in their shelters to occupy less protected areas. In addition to providing information which may be released to the public, the RADEF officer will be required to periodically brief the EOC operations staff on the fallout situation and assist them in solving operational problems. In addition, the RADEF officer may initiate the mobile monitoring of specific areas or facilities. This could include detailed monitoring of the ground around essential facilities and aerial monitoring activities in accordance with state plans. To minimize exposure, he will advise the CD director on the need for the continued stay of persons in shelters or the movement of people to better shelter or to areas of lower dose rate. In providing for earlier reactivation of some selected important facilities and areas, he will consider the use of decontamination methods to reduce radiation hazards. As long as such hazard exists, the Civil Defense Director will continue to need this RADEF officer's answers to questions on radiation decay characteristics, fallout entry time estimates, and establishment of allowable dose criteria. The people of Dan Carter's city have every reason to trust his skill as RADEF officer. He and his staff have been well trained. They have spent many hours in perfecting their skills. As long as the radiological hazard exists, men like Dan Carter and his staff will be needed.